Hello everyone, I am Aurora Elmore, the Cooperative Institute Manager for NOAA Ocean Exploration. I want to start by thanking you all for joining us today for the sixth iteration of this NOAA Science Seminar Series. This is the final part of a six-part webinar about NOAA's Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, also known as OECI. Throughout these webinars, we get the opportunity to meet OECI team and hear about their exciting projects in deep sea exploration. The OECI is a partnership between NOAA, the University of Rhode Island, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of Southern Mississippi, University of New Hampshire, and the nonprofit Ocean Exploration Trust. For some general information before we begin the webinar, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted with closed captioning shortly after the webinar. Live closed captioning is available now, and the link for live closed captioning has been posted in the YouTube description. We encourage audience questions to come through throughout the presentation. You'll be able to ask questions in the live YouTube chat box, but you must be signed in in order to do that with a YouTube account. So for those of you with a NOAA.gov email address or any other .gov email address, in order to ask a question, you'll need to either sign in to YouTube with your personal email address or you can email your questions to OECI underscore questions at uri.edu. And now to start today's presentation, I'm very pleased to introduce Dwight Coleman, the director of the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island. Hey, Aurora, thanks. And uh, welcome everyone to the final seminar in this series. Uh, we're very pleased to be hosting it here from the University of Rhode Island. I am the director of the Inner Space Center. I'll be the host for this hour. And uh, I'm sitting uh, in the conference room that's for the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. And behind me is the Inner Space Center. And we're actually looking at live feeds that are coming in now uh, from the EV Nautilus as they're exploring some seamounts south of the Hawaiian seamount chain. And uh, we'll be going live to that ship shortly and, uh, and, and catching up with the researchers on board that ship. Uh, but for now, I want to uh, kick this off uh, with our dean, Dr. Paula Bontempe. She's the dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here in person today because she's attending the AGU conference down in New Orleans. So we'll turn it over to this pre-recorded video uh, from Paula describing what we do here at GSO and how it relates to the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. URI GSO is proud to host the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute in partnership with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of New Hampshire, the Ocean Exploration Trust, and the University of Southern Mississippi. We are grateful to NOAA for the funding for the Cooperative Institute. I deliver this welcome from Narragansett, Rhode Island, the traditional land of the Narragansett Tribal Nation. I honor their histories and ancestors and perseverance in our communities today as our country was built on indigenous land. I acknowledge the indigenous people ongoing genocide and forced removal from their land. I honor their stewardship of the land, sea, and resources that they hold sacred and that we shepherd together. The fourth National Climate Assessment on impacts, risks, and adaptation in the United States highlights the disproportionate impacts of climate change on indigenous communities. This threat is highlighted in the IPCC Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere in 2019 and stresses that our communities must work together as social and environmental justice must be central to our climate strategies and solutions. GSO has a very long-standing history with NOAA and a long-standing relationship and collaboration in science. We work together to explore the ocean's depths, to better manage our coastal and ocean ecosystems, and of course, GSO's founding Dean John Knaus was the NOAA administrator from 1989 to 1993. And we look back on that fondly as we celebrate our 60th anniversary this year in 2021. I would like to speak a little bit about what makes GSO such a special place and a remarkable institution a remarkable community of ocean professionals. We train an interdisciplinary climate literate workforce 
At this time, we have more than 1,000 alums spread across the globe. They range from federal employees to academics to nonprofits. GSO conducts research that helps our blue economy partners find solutions to local and global challenges. Different sectors of the blue economy become extremely important as climate change accelerates. These involve water quality and waste management, renewable energy, climate change, tourism and recreation, and other fields like maritime transportation, as well as fisheries and seafood security. We are transforming our campus facilities to plan for the next 60 years of what we wish to accomplish at the Graduate School of Oceanography and at the Narragansett Bay Campus. This is everything from science to the intersection of science and business, the entrepreneurship that our students desire and expose all of our students, all of our faculty and staff to the spirit of innovation. We are focused on increasing our public visibility, our engagement, and our impact. We do this through a number of media, including telepresence, live and pre-recorded production. We reach out to our K through 12 demographic, our undergraduates and our graduate students. Digital presence is absolutely central to who and what we're thinking about. The seminar you're watching today and other OECI seminars are produced here by GSO at the Inner Space Center. Absolutely central to everything we're thinking about at the Graduate School of Oceanography centers on our campus environment being more inclusive and our people having a greater sense of belonging, increased mentorship, and justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion are absolutely central to what we're thinking about for our future. So thank you to NOAA, thank you to our OECI partners, and thank you to all of you for joining us at this seminar today. I hope you enjoy it. Can tell uh, we here at uh, the Graduate School of Oceanography is really committed to the mission of the OECI and all of our OECI partners. And uh, the Inner Space Center really is uh, sort of at the forefront of uh, continuing the telepresence paradigm for uh, supporting ocean-based exploration and, and uh, education as well. And we'll continue that uh, as we progress through the OECI in the future. Uh, so I would like to remind everyone, as Aurora mentioned in the beginning, to please uh, Think about your questions and type your, your questions into the YouTube chat and we'll do our best to get all, all your questions answered by um, later, later on in the episode. Um, but right now I would like to uh, uh, take it live to the EV Nautilus where uh, OECI director Adam Sewell is uh, standing by. Hey Adam, how's it going out there? Great, yeah, welcome uh, to EV Nautilus. Uh, we're out here on station in the Central Pacific. We're right next to the Papahana Mokuakea uh, National Marine Mo Monument. That's the Wahi Kapuna of the Hawaiian people and the largest marine conservation area in the United States. We want to acknowledge uh, the generations of indigenous Hawaiians who uh, steward these waters. It's a privilege to conduct our exploration and ex expeditions here. We're working closely with uh, the OECI partner, Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, that the trust is working with the Marine National Monument Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group Nomenclature Committee. And they generously shared a tremendous amount of thought and, and energy to support the naming of the Nautilus expeditions, including this one, uh, which is named, bear with me here, Lu'u'a'ea Hiki Ike Kua Lono Kai. And, uh, that name represents the journey to and, and the work in the Kualona Kai, uh, or the sea ridges represented by these by these seamounts. Uh, we're located just south of the Hawaiian island chain, and these seamounts hold key information for deepening our understanding of a Hawaiian's volcanic history, uh, natural resources, and uh, and the habitats that that they provide. So within this region of the, the Central Pacific and the US EEZ more broadly, what you can see is these blue areas. Uh, we are tasked as OECI uh, through NOAA Ocean Exploration with advancing uh, exploration of the deep sea to gain knowledge about our nation's submerged resources for the benefit of Americans. And it's worth noting that the submerged land, the blue areas in this map, of the United States are just as large as the terrestrial part that we live on, and yet we know very little about them. So we're excited to be contributing to uh, exploring these areas, especially in the Central Pacific, where uh, you know it's far from home, but uh, part of our our uh, resources as a society. 
So you may wonder why we are exactly where we are. Um, we're in a small chain of seamounts located north and west of the island of Kauai, uh, just outside the boundary of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. These seamounts, uh, which you can see in the foreground here, have never been visited by humans. So we're making the first exploration of this area. There are seven seamounts in this kind of curved chain, and it sits between the, the Hawaiian islands, uh, or the chain of uh, submerged islands, the Molokai fracture zone, and at the far east end of what's called the Mid-Pacific Mountains. Each seamount emerges from the abyssal seafloor at more than 4,000 meters depth and rises about two kilometers. And we ended up at this spot uh, through the guidance of NOAA Ocean Exploration, which takes a look at all the unexplored regions, identifies priority regions, and this uh, to fill the gaps in our, our coverage and, and our observations. And these were chosen because they rise up off the seafloor, they have unique habitat for organisms, and they're gonna provide uh, new information that, that helps us understand the whole uh, US EEZ. Seamounts like these dot the whole US EEZ, uh, especially out here in the Central Pacific. Most of them have never been visited or scientifically uh, surveyed by humans, but they're really important. They rise out of the heavily sedimented abyssal plain and they create unique habitat for organisms, in particular because they are made up of hard rock and many of the organisms that we've been seeing on this expedition are the types that like to attach to hard rocks, corals and sponges, and all the associated animals that, that live with them. In addition, these seamounts, because they rise up, uh, they cause localized upwelling and mixing of the ocean waters and they bring nutrients and food across their surfaces that, that these filter feeders um, rely on. The ecosystems that you find on these seamounts are generally uh, more diverse than what you find in the flat sedimented abyssal plains. That's uh, you know, both because of the, the currents and because of the hard surfaces that, uh, that the animals attach to. Um, but it's not just the animals that attach to the rocks within the corals and the sponges. There are associate animals or organisms. Both these animals might live together and have no negative impact on each other, but a coral might have a sea star intertwined with it that's climbed up in order to uh, get into that flow where there's food and, and nutrients. And that's something we're seeing routinely um, on the on this expedition. So you're looking now at a at, I believe, a black coral. You can see the coral polyps. These are real different from the ones you find in, in shallow reefs. Um, first of all, they live for a very long time, probably tens to hundreds of years, uh, and they grow up on these stalks in order to get into the flow, and you can see polyps lining uh, the stalks. So, so as we look, look at these uh, corals and sponges in the deep sea, it's not unusual that we would find some that have never been seen before or never described before. So it's really exciting to, to do this exploration. Um, you know, the, the opportunity to find new species uh, and, and, especially, and also to look at species that haven't been studied in great detail in the deep ocean is um, great for science, but it's also great for society as well. There's lots of examples of bioactive compounds coming from the organisms uh, of the types that we're looking at that have benefit for, for humans, both for uh, medical applications, uh, but also there are recent examples of the types of, of chemicals that corals uh, have on their surface to prevent other organisms from attaching are similar or can be used for uh, ships to keep uh, organisms from attaching to those as well. So there's, it's really exciting to um, be doing this work that that in a few steps, you know, might have a real benefit for uh, for society. Part of the reason that the compounds here are potentially interesting is because that the organis organisms have had to adapt to pretty harsh environments. There's uh, extreme pressure, there's very low light, and there's low food sources. And so their adaptations uh, to meet this environmental niche uh, may pay off uh, for us. So these kind of bio resources are resources are something that we're very interested in. But it's not only the living resources that, that we're interested in, but also the uh, submer or the 
non-living resources. We're actually looking live right now at video from Hercules, and you're seeing um, a volcanic terrain. These are pillow lavas, and you can see a, a coral attached to, to one of the pillows. Um, but rather than seeing the volcanic rock itself, what we're actually seeing is iron manganese crust. And uh, Coralie Rodriguez, a uh, graduate student on board, is going to explain to you the research she's doing to try and understand these um, mineral resources that are uh, uh, kind of part and parcel with the, the seamounts that we're looking at. So when we uh, are down here, you know, the goal of our exploration is to gain a systematic and comprehensive understanding of the environment from its chemical, physical, and biological perspectives. We primarily are using um, uh, the, the ship, which gets us out here, of course, and the ROV Hercules to get a closer look at the seafloor. In addition, we use the human resources, a group of scientific experts that are, are both here on the ship and back on shore connected via telepresence. The vessel we're on, EV Nautilus, is uh, bringing these tools and people out to the remote Pacific and, and keeping us uh, safe and comfortable while doing so. One of the tools on the ship that we use quite a lot is uh, uh, the, the multi-beam sonar. We use that to make bathymetric maps of the seafloor in order to understand where the most interesting features are uh, and, and guide our exploration with ROVs. So the multi-beam sonar uh, bounces, uses sound. It bounces millions, uh, sound off millions of points on the seafloor that we then put together into a bathymetric surface to reveal the shape and composition of the seafloor. You can see an example of the mapping that we've done during this uh, expedition, some of which we had to do because the weather was a little bit rough for diving. But in this area, there is some pretty good maps, but there are gaps within it. And so we use the time when we're not diving to uh, fill in those gaps, and ultimately, we want to try and produce a uh, you know comprehensive map of the ocean floor, not just us, uh, but the but the uh, whole federal government. In particular, there is a uh, program called NOMEC, uh, which which gathers together all the federal agencies to meet the goal of complete mapping of the U.S. Uh, exclusive economic zone by 2030. We also use that bathymetry to plan our dives. Uh, so if back at ISC, if you could queue up the, the map with the dive track on it, we're traversing seamounts from their base to their summit. We want to understand the structure of the ecosystem as a function of depth. Uh, we also want to collect rock samples across a, a vertical transect. And so you can see how we use the bathymetric map to find ridges uh, along the seamount and, and features that may be interesting uh, in order to plan out a, a dive track that's going to be most productive in terms of identifying uh, the, the biology and the, the geology of the region. The ROV, you know, with, with a bathymetric map, we can see the shape of the seafloor. We can know that we're going to this ridge or that ridge. But the ROV is, is the tool that really helps us make observations at the scale of individual organisms, and importantly, collect the samples that we need to uh, validate our observations and, uh, and in the future conduct uh, research, both not just by us, but by the entire scientific community. Uh, in the case of, of the seamounts that we're looking at, these unnamed seamounts, we are looking to sample organisms that, that we haven't, haven't been described before, and as I mentioned, the crusts on the the rocks that we're using to look not just at the the rock itself but the rare metals that uh, that are uh, concentrated by the precipitation of those crusts and i'm excited for Coralie to tell you more about what she's doing uh, so far on this expedition we've uh, approached the seamounts from different directions and we've seen really different uh, environments uh, based on the direction we're coming from it, in some directions, we see lots of accumulation of sediment. Uh, on, in other directions, we see that it's been scoured clean of sediment, and that seems to have some correlation with the density and, and diversity of, uh, of the biology. Understanding the, the biology uh, is important not just for what's there now, but how it's going to change in the future. We know that uh, the deep sea uh, will feel the impacts of, of 
anthropogenic forces, uh, but we don't know exactly on what time scales or in what way. So uh, part of those, part of the our effort is to conduct a, a baseline surveys that the research community can use later on. In order to to make the best uh, use of our observations that we're collecting in uh, with the ROV, we have expert uh, scientists guiding each ROV dive. Those experts rotate through shifts uh, in a control van, which you can see behind me, four hours on, eight hours off, four hours back on. Uh, on this cruise, each of the dives have been lasting around 24 to, to 32 hours before we bring the vehicle up, generally because we've reached the top of the seamount and we've collected all the samples we're able to. Um, but we don't always have the expertise we need sitting in front of the, the screens watching what's happening. And that's where uh, this, this uh, exploration, exploration vessel Nautilus and similar exploration vessels uh, operated by NOAA, Okeanos Explorer, for example, have really made great use of telepresence. So we have the ability to connect to shore in, in the way that we're doing right now uh, over the web, but also directly to interested scientists who can help us make identifications and who can help guide uh, sampling. Uh, so I, I'm excited also for you to hear more about uh, telepresence and how that works and how it helps us achieve our, our scientific goals. Uh, but for now, I'll send it back to Dwight at uh, GSO and uh, hopefully talk to you again soon. Great. Thanks, Adam. It's awesome that uh, we're exploring live while you're, while you're talking. Uh, it's actually happening and research is, is happening on the seafloor now. So for this next segment, uh, I'd like to introduce... Uh, Coralie Rodriguez. Uh, she's a graduate student here at the Graduate School of Oceanography. So, hey, Coralie, can you tell us a little bit about your research and your role on the on this expedition? Hi, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Coralie Rodriguez, and I'm a student at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. I'm advised by Dr. Katie Kelly there, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, what I'm doing. So right now I'm here on the Nautilus. I'm collecting samples for my research on metal and rare earth element concentrations in ferromanganese crusts. So ferromanganese deposits as a whole is a category of hydrogenetic rocks that precipitate um, onto either hard surfaces like the seamounts we're on right now and we call those crusts or they can also precipitate around a particle on the seafloor and we call those nodules. Um, and they're pretty cool because they're incredibly slow growing um, the average growth rate is about one to 10 millimeters per million years. Um, and then if you guys could bring up the photo from the NA114 cruise. So hopefully you guys are seeing this photo. This is from a Nautilus cruise, NA114 in 2019. And it was to the Baker and Howland Islands and Johnston Atoll. So the light color stuff you see inside is altered volcanic rock and the darker parts on the outside is the ferromanganese crust. And so this crust is about a centimeter thick, which you can imagine equates to possibly millions of years of deposition. So these crusts and nodules are really important because they contain rare earth um, elements and metals such as cobalt, manganese, and nickel. Um, and other economically valuable metals. And these have become increasingly important in the production of wind turbines, cars, computers, um, and they're in short supply on land. And there's also sometimes humanitarian issues surrounding them. So about 70% of the world's cobalt comes from the Dominican Republic of Congo. And uh, working conditions there are extremely harsh. Uh, children, like, are miners as well and there's little to no safety regulations and you can imagine the wages are pretty bad as well. Um, so these deposits on the seafloor are thought to contain some millions of tons of these metals and it's possible and maybe even likely that we'll be mining these in the near future. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to provide the best possible information on the factors that control the enrichments of these crusts so that uh, extraction can be done with the least impact to the environment. Uh, these crusts are composed mostly of iron and manganese, which begin as negatively charged manganese oxide and positively charged uh, iron oxyhydroxide ions. These ions scavenge oppositely charged rare metal ions from the ocean, and then they lock them into precipitates in these crusts and nodules. 
So oh, my research is investigating how the properties of seawater affects this process. And one of the really cool things about working with the Lenautilus and other ROV cruises is that each sample has corresponding water sensor data on temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen at the point of sample collection. Um, and what we see is that oxygen decreases with depth in the ocean, leading to an oxygen minimum zone. And these can vary in scale and abruptness um, in different regions of the ocean. Uh, and so some of the samples we've looked at so far uh, occupy the high end of cobalt enrichment. Um, hopefully you guys can see some of my results so far, uh, especially compared to other studies um, in, in the Pacific. So we utilize the top scrape method where uh, I only scrape the top less than one millimeter of crust. And we do this so that it best corresponds with our water sensor data. So far, we found that cobalt concentrations in the crust negatively correspond with oxygen content in the water. Specifically on this expedition, though, I'm collecting samples with thick ferromanganese crust and adjacent water samples on vertical transects up the seamounts using ROV Hercules. Once the ROV is recovered, I take my water samples back to the lab. I filter them over there, and I'm hoping to bring them uh, I'm going to leave them at University of Hawaii, and then I'm hoping to come back this summer and do analyses on them with ICPMS. And then with the rocks, I'm going to take them back to GSO, and I'm going to do a suite of geochemical analyses. And then what I hope to do is take both the water and rock pairs and the data I get on those to see if there's a relationship between the two. Uh, so this is my first time uh, on the Nautilus and my first time out at sea. Uh, and one of the really cool things about getting to go to GSO was I was really excited at the opportunity to be able to go in the field, all the opportunities to go in the field and go on cruises and collect my own samples. And I'm super grateful to OECI for giving me the opportunity to come on the Nautilus now and for also letting me play an integral role in the sampling collection. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it back off to you, Dwight. Hey, that's great, Coralie. Thanks so much. Um, we have time for a quick question also. I'll jump in and just expand on your, your last comments about it's your first cruise on the Nautilus. So this must be a pretty interesting experience for you with all this technology, not just to control the ROVs and do the mapping and pick the dive sites, but also uh, do the telepresence uh, uh, connection. So just expand on that a little bit with, uh, with your thoughts about how, how about this experience for you. Yeah, I mean, I never really expected a cruise could be this well connected, I guess. Um, honestly, just this little like headset thing, I was like kind of crazy to me because it's, I don't know, that's a technology I've never used before. <laughs> um, but yeah, the te like the idea of telepresence is really cool. Um, before I left, I was super like, nervous about getting prepared and stuff. And it was awesome because my advisor was super supportive and was telling me if you ever need anything or if anything ever like goes wrong or whatever for anything, because it's so easy to connect with her. She was like, I'll go, I'll run to ISC anytime you need. And then there's also a ship to shore direct line and to URI. And so she was like, I'll pick up the phone if you need me to. So we're really well connected here. And uh, how, how has the sampling been going for you? Are, are you collecting good samples so far this expedition uh, for your research? Yeah, I think we are. We're collecting a lot of rocks. Um, it's kind of become a joke. Uh, everyone, every time someone collects rocks, they're like, hey, we got you a really great rock, uh, which is always fun. Yeah, now every time someone says we got you a rock, I'm like, cool, thanks. <laughs> but um, the water sampling is something I've never done before. Um, so I was really glad that I was able to uh, Veronique Oldham's lab at URI or at GSO. Uh, she was able to help me a lot uh, with the water sampling. It's very thankful to everyone who's helped get me this far. Fantastic. Thank you a lot, Coralie. Uh, so Thanks. I want to remind everyone to, to ask questions. Um, like, like we've mentioned a few times already, type your questions into the YouTube chat. Uh, hopefully we'll have lots of great questions and Adam and, and Coralie, thanks for your, for your time. Uh, we're gonna have you stick around though, of course, cause uh, we have uh, additional segments that'll involve you later in the broadcast. And um, uh, we want you to uh, be on standby for answering some of these questions. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and um, transition to kind of explain the, a little bit about the history of telepresence, how we got here and where it's going in the future. And I'll have a few guests that I'll introduce in a minute uh, that work here at the Inner Space Center. 
But I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about sort of the, the, the history and the, and the man whose vision it was to get uh, telepresence enabled ocean exploration off the ground. And that's Dr. Robert Ballard. He really is the, the founder of uh, this technology and the pioneer of this technology. And he had a vision back in the early 1980s for the way uh, we can have a futuristic look at how we're gonna explore the ocean. And uh, this is with advanced mapping systems as depicted here. And this is an artistic rendering that was published in National Geographic Magazine in 1981. Uh, we have ro robotic, uh, co robotically controlled or remotely controlled vehicle systems, towed vehicle systems, and uh, hull mounted uh, uh, sonar mapping system. So uh, all of this information through the power of satellite telecommunications and video broadcasting technology, you can package that all together and, and beam it ashore. And certainly Dr. Ballard did that in the 1980s, uh, uh, late 1980s and early 1990s with the Jason project. And he had a very broad audience of, of uh, uh, students and, and teachers that were interested in what we were doing. And, he really pioneered this effort and had a, had a dream when he came to the Graduate School of Oceanography in 2002 to kind of build a permanent facility to uh, uh, enable telepresence for more ships. And that's, uh, that's really when uh, the Okeanos Explorer started coming online and the uh, EV Nautilus uh, started coming online. And uh, we built the Interspace Center facility to support all this and it's growing into the future, but it's evolving and changing. And so the, the more recent graphic that de depicts how we do uh, um, telepresence is uh, we can show now. And it, it shows how we have Hercules and Ar Argus connected through their tethers up to, the, up to the ship where the control systems are for controlling those ROVs. So we get the data and the video up to the ship. And then over the satellite link, we connect to the satellite and from the satellite down to the Earth station and then onto the internet backbone and over to the Inner Space Center. But, you know, this is another illustration, a, a, a graphical uh, explanation of, of how we envision telepresence with a lot of sort of green, magical, wavy lines. And the reality is it's, um, it's much more intricate than that. And under the hood, you know, sort of the nuts and bolts that make telepresence hap happen are quite complex. So next I wanna introduce uh, uh, Rachel Simon. She's an electrical engineer here, here at the ISC. Hi, Rachel, can you uh, introduce yourself? Howdy folks, my name is Rachel Simon and my, I am an electrical engineer at the ISC. My specific background is in wireless communications and networking. Great, thanks, Rachel. So uh, you just saw sort of my, my take on uh, some of the technologies and the graphical representations, but under the hood, it's, it's much more complex than that. Can you describe what some of the components are needed to enable telepresence? Sure, two major components. The first is our satellite infrastructure. So at sea, there's no fiber, cable, cell towers. So the only way for us to get our signal back to shore is using satellites in space. Satellites, or birds as we call them, are essentially a giant mirror that bounces our signal off so that it can get back home. Now, because of the vast distances involved going from ship to space and back to shore, we have to transmit with a tremendous amount of power and we've got a very weak signal coming back from shore. Uh, because of all of that, there's a considerable amount of infrastructure that's needed to transmit and receive the signal such that we can build this bi-directional circuit and have a, you know, enclose the link back home. Um, and as you can see here, these are some of the components involved in actually making that connection happen. The second part of our infrastructure on board is the networking infrastructure. Despite all of this RF equipment needed to establish a connection back home, what that does is that builds the connection. The next step is because of our bandwidth is so limited at sea, what we need is, is we need to have a highly intelligent network infrastructure that can prior protect, prioritize, and identify specific mission traffic. In addition to our live ROV video, live broadcasts such as what you're watching now, our mapping data being transferred home, and just the digital you know, family life of all the folks at sea, we have to identify all those different traffic flows and make sure that mission-related traffic is prioritized. free network and, and lots of redundancy built in. We really can't afford any points of failure. And, uh, um, you know, the audiences often just kind of watch the feeds and think it's all uh, working quite easily. But, uh, uh, you know, the engine has to keep running and we spend a lot of time troubleshooting and, and fixing things. So can you also explain sort of, uh, you know, how this uh, technology is evolving? Sure. So the very origins of actual practical seagoing telepresence, we actually took a lot of inspiration from the sports broadcasting world. 
when you think about how a sports broadcast, like say the Super Bowl works, you've got a stadium, you've got a satellite, and then you've got all the viewers back at home. And that was actually originally a very good parallel for the ocean or the seagoing exploration world. We were able to utilize this, the architecture and the procedure defined by the broadcast world to build these exploration command centers, ECCs where scientists could gather and be at a shore-based replica of an ROV control center. Obviously, as broadcast TV has been replaced by services like Netflix and Amazon Prime, our technology is evolving too. We are embracing tools such as Zoom, WhatsApp, FaceTime, which supplement the live video from the ROV with direct face-to-face -face interaction with scientists on board. Cool, and so we have uh, lots of different tools that are available to us for, for the science user on shore. Can you uh, describe what some, of, what some of those tools are and, and how the scientists use them? Sure. So the first step is always the, the science portal, which integrates some real-time data, uh, position of the vessel, as well as live video coming in. The primary purpose of the science portal is one, you know, right now, what you're seeing right now with this live exploration happening is that's giving the scientists a live view of the ROV's cameras, whether it's the ROV's main camera or perhaps additional views uh, used during sampling operations. What this dashboard provides is basically, it's, what it's doing is it's, it's getting everybody on the same page. So during explorations, you can see the ROV cameras, but it's also a very helpful tool to just assess what's happening with the ship. For example, if you're looking at deck cameras, you can see, is the ship transiting? Is the ship on station? Is the sea state rough or is it stable? And what that does is it gives you very powerful informal tools to assess what's happening. So that way, you don't necessarily need to wait for a formal situation report to come from the ship. The best way to see it is, is that these tools are a jumping off point for a greater degree of face-to-face -face interaction. So for example, if you can see that a sample is being taken on the live video dashboard, then you have the opportunity to actually follow up with the scientists processing that sample onshore using a tool like Zoom or FaceTime or WhatsApp. Great, and in fact, you're sitting in front of one of the more modern versions of one of these uh, exploration command centers. So, uh, and we keep experimenting with sort of new tools and techniques and technologies. Can you explain how some of these uh, emerging technologies uh, will, will change telepresence for the future? Right now, we are in the very early stages of seeing massive disruption, in, in fact, in our basic satellite infrastructure. Historically speaking, all of these satellites we've worked with have been in geosynchronous orbit a nice simple point in the sky that's very far away, it requires a lot of power to reach that point. And one of the issues we run into is those old satellite systems only covered limited areas of the ocean. If you were to take a look at a map of different specific satellite beams, one of the challenges that we have in expedition planning, like if you look here, a simple transit from California to Hawaii, you've got to constantly switch between different beams. And not, that means more work for the folks on the ship and that also means a lot of work during expedition planning because you have to make sure that each one of those beams has enough capacity to support our operations. The promise of low Earth or orbit systems such as Starlink, what these promise is more bandwidth, lower latency, but more importantly, simplified operations. There's a single antenna, a single system that just works no matter where you are on the planet. Now, this advances in connectivity is great, but one of the problems we have with tech is that no matter how great the tech is, it can never really keep track of user expectations. So what we're seeing is on one hand, we have the disruption coming from low Earth or systems such as Starlink, but that's being checked by the increased immersion that tools like VR and the metaverse are gonna provide us. Right, so we're, yeah, we're looking at a future that's bright with lots of bandwidth, still not as good as what we would have at our homes necessarily. But um, it, all this technology, all these possibilities, you know, how does everything balance? So one of the things that we're going to find is, is that regardless of how advanced the satellite technology is, there's never going to be enough bandwidth, right? Because we can never really 100% keep up with what the users want. Over the years, what we are shifting, we are shifting away from this rigid hierarchical broadcast model to a user-driven model. We're, we're embracing tools like Zoom. We're embracing Google Drive. And on one hand, that's really empowering the user base. But on the other hand, because bandwidth is always going to be limited, 
it makes it a lot easier for users to step on each other. So what it comes down to is having a two-part model, making sure that we have technological and also procedural steps to being able to use that limited pipe effectively. One of the things that we've actually lost over the years is you no longer have a specific video engineer who's quarterbacking every single thing that goes through that satellite. That function, to make sure that we can still embrace tools like Zoom and Google Drive, what we need to do is we need to have a technological solution. That means making our network more intelligent so that everybody can see at a glance exactly what's happening. And on the procedural side, it's making sure that, that the science, the ship ops, and the production teams, once they have that dashboard of what's going on, it's about making sure that they have the information they need so those teams can effectively communicate and use limited satellite resources in the most efficient way possible. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel. Yeah, a lot. We have our work cut out for us to plan for this uh, this uh, interesting future where everything's uh, going virtual. So next, I'd like to queue up a, a video uh, that shows a little bit of the telepresence in action. Uh, we, we recorded a, a GSO professor, Katie Kelly, who actually is Coralie's uh, major professor here at GSO, uh, who's a marine geologist, as she was uh, participating in one of the dives uh, from last Friday. Hi, Coralie. Good morning. Hi, Katie. How's your experience on the Nautilus so far? It's good. It's a little bumpy. Bumpiness is to be expected. That's okay. I'm glad that your uh, conditions are calm enough for the dive to proceed. I was excited to hear the microphones spring to life in the middle of the night last night while I was working on something. <laughs> so, have you sat? You didn't sit a watch during the dive last night, is that right? I was at the first dive when we were descending, but I didn't see any rocks. Okay. So this is your first time looking at the seafloor? Uh, well, I did come back <laughs> when they had rocks. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what do you um, notice about the condition of the rocks here on the seafloor? There's a lot of like sediment on top of them which I was kind of surprised about. Um, and also everyone is, seems to be surprised that there's no biology here. Or I'm surprised by that too. Barren. There are rocks yeah. right here, Kelly. Oh. There are bigger Bob rocks, Ballard. yeah. You see them? Oh. And a floaty thing. This would be a are good, there, oh, 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 good place to sample. Timing. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, These are, this is a great spot to sample, if that's okay. I just saw him bulldoze. Oh, that one. That's right, oh, right there. Yeah. That one. That one. Grab the baseball sized yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they look like. He That's was a little bigger than a baseball. So they look like they, are, they'll be, uh, won't be cemented. Let's see. Yeah. That's great. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. You like that on the starboard side there, back row? Yeah, starboard A. Starboard A. Forward. We've seen. And for Coralie, oh, for Coralie's interest, yeah. that nice black, very black crust on the out. Yeah, that's just um, that's exactly what she's looking for. Let me know when you're ready for a sample, Salvo. Okay, guys. I think I'm going to be signing off from the ISC here. But I will be um, tuning in on the website, and you know if I see anything cool, I'll uh, I'll type it in the chat box, or um, you know maybe I'll I'll pop back over here a little later in the day. I'm really excited. This is a uh, it's so much fun even just be sitting here in Rhode Island watching <laughs> and participating with you guys. So thanks for the opportunity this morning. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Katie. Uh, have a great cruise, Coralie. It's Thanks. nice to talk to you all. You too. Bye. Bye. Great. So you can kind of see how uh, how easy we make it look, really, with uh, the tools that we've developed for telepresence, the bandwidth that we have shipped ashore for Nautilus, and uh, really enabling uh, Katie to you know do her job and and uh, interact with the with the team on board the ship. And this is really powerful because there's a lot of folks that aren't physically able to get to sea, or people that have conflicts with their busy schedules and uh, 
this is one of the advantages of telepresence is uh, we can stay connected and still take part in these expeditions, but not have to uh, abandon life and, and go to sea necessarily for 30 days at a time or whatever. So really powerful technology and uh, uh, thanks for that. And my last question for Rachel really is seeing that video and sort of how we develop these tools for the science user to, uh, to participate from shore. We're trying to move in a direction where teleengineering, teleoperations can take place and other types of things can happen over telepresence. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Absolutely. So one of the best ways to see teleengineering in action is, is when it comes to supporting these vehicles. You've got a limited number of berths for the techs who are actually going to pilot and maintain the vehicles. So let's say we've got our ROV and we're down at 3,000 meters and we blow our suction sampler. So we've got to recover the vehicle and we've got to fix that problem. Now, the ROV itself is filled with many intricate electrical, hydraulic, and mechanical components. And let's say that the specialist who designed that suction mm -hmm. sampler isn't on board. Being able to have somebody put on a, uh, a, you know, a body-worn camera and being able so that that specialist who's on shore has the ability to see exactly which wire or which hydraulic connection or which gauge that tech is actually measuring, that is a game changer for being able to resolve these issues quickly and get those vehicles back in the water. Great, thanks so much, Rachel. Yeah, these are, this is a really great uh, introduction to the technicalities here of supporting telepresence. So please stand by for, uh, in case there's more questions coming your way, but now I'd like to hand it off to um, Holly Morin. Uh, hey, Holly, how you doing? Can you introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Dwight. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Holly Morin, and I'm the Manager of Education and Outreach here at the Inner Space Center. Uh, you, you've seen how uh, we're, we're using telepresence. As you know, we live and breathe it every day here on ships like the Nautilus and the Okeanos Explorer. But um, can you talk a little bit about how we use telepresence for uh, accomplishing sort of our educational outreach uh, missions and things like that, and also working on other platforms? Definitely. Yeah. So just like telepresence is used for those important ship to shore activities for scientists and other ocean exploration experts, it's an equally important tool to bring non-science experts into the fold and engage everybody, uh, broadening the participation and awareness of ocean exploration to diverse audiences. So there are several projects to which the IAC has been involved with, uh, but two of them, two keystone examples. Uh, the first is the NSF funded Northwest Passage Project. Uh, and this was conducted in 2019. Uh, there was a group of us, a multidisciplinary team of scientists, students, filmmakers, and other professionals that were on board the Swedish Polar Research Secretariat's Odin, an icebreaker you see there. Uh, we sailed through the Canadian uh, Arctic Archipelago. Uh, in addition to conducting important science to understand the changing Arctic, uh, we also were using telepresence connectivity to conduct live interactions, over 40 of them, to the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, uh, the Alaska Sea Life Center, and then the Exploratorium in California. And you can see some of that footage here. That's me with one of our students on board, uh, Tristan Millstone. Um, and those are really a great experience for science communication for the students, but also to uh, bring audiences on board with us, on board the Odin to the Arctic, uh, an environment, uh, a challenging environment that a lot of people may not otherwise be able to see or visit. Um, and we really inspired or wanted to inspire a future generation of oceanographers and get kids and students excited uh, to go on themselves to be ocean scientists and and do the work that we're doing. Uh, another example happened about three months later. We actually stretched both poles in 2019, uh, and we were on board the RV Gold, and uh, we went to Antarctica to the Western um, to Palmer Station in the Western Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, a distinction here was that we were using the onboard network of the ship. So we had our own satellite dome on board the Odin and brought all of our own telepresence connectivity gear. Uh, you can see here the MTU and other things that we had with us uh, to produce these shows from the Gould, but we were using the ship's onboard network. And we connected live to classrooms uh, and also streamed to Facebook uh, Live as well uh, to again, showcase the science that was being conducted at Palmer Station, but also the work, the, the individuals that work at the station to keep it running throughout the year. Uh, so some workforce development, career connections there. And again, we really wanted to inspire uh, the, the next generation of ocean explorers and, you know, to think about life beyond a ship and what the different roles are uh, in ocean exploration and how individuals uh, can find a place for themselves uh, in ocean science, which is really, uh, really important. Um, Dwight, uh, we've actually got a lot of questions coming in. I'm watching our time here mm -hmm. on uh, YouTube. So if you don't mind, I'm actually going to pivot to one of those Please. to throw it back to uh, 
Adam and Corley on board the ship. And, and Brian Midson actually asked early on, Adam, to you uh, about the seamounts uh, that you all are exploring. He wants to know if those are all Cretaceous seamounts or if there's any evidence for more recent orogeny there. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And thanks to Brian for tuning in. Um, the the seamounts themselves, the prevailing hypothesis would be that they're of Cretaceous age, part of the mid-Pacific mountains that are nearby, uh, but they kind of sit between those uh, other seamounts and the Hawaiian chain. So it's a bit of an open question since there's never been a sample collected from these seamounts. And one of the things we'll be doing is looking at the chemistry of the rocks and seeing whether they have more affinity to the Hawaiian chain or to uh, the Cretaceous age seamounts. We haven't seen anything like a hydrothermal vent, so we know that they're they're pretty old, uh, but we just don't know how old they are yet. And then how, just for me, I will own it. I am a marine mammal biologist by training. How do you age a seamount? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's, if you needed a quick answer, one thing you could do is look at the thickness of that manganese crust. We know about how quickly it grows. And so by measuring its thickness, we can, and we know it's pretty thick here, uh, that's it's some, you could estimate the millions of years. But for a more precise estimate, use a radiogenic isotopes. So there's a lots of different isotope systems where the clock starts when the lava cools. And, and for these rocks, you would use potassium argon or argon argon. Fantastic. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm actually, because these questions are so fantastic, keep them coming. I'm going to throw one actually uh, to Dwight, to you and Rachel. Um, so Jay Dunn wants to know about telepresence. Has the ISC been investigating cloud streaming services? <laughs> Thanks for the question, Jay. Yeah, of course. Uh, in fact, uh, we're doing some of our live streaming with the Okeanos Explorer directly to the cloud now. Uh, so we, we're, we have a collection of on-premise uh, equipment, servers basically, that take the feeds in and send the feeds out to YouTube and the internet for uh, the, pu the public audiences and for the private audiences as well. But Rachel, why don't you describe a little bit about how uh, the cloud is really reshaping our lives for what we're going to do in the future? Well, on one hand, the, the cloud environments relieve us of the, of the administrative responsibility of operating all these servers. However, there are changes necessary to the overall network architecture. So I wouldn't say that we're investigating, we've actually moved on to actively testing. And what we're doing is, is we're making sure that we identify both the billing implications uh, from, for the cloud. Your, your most grants are based upon a capital equipment cycle, whereas for cloud, all of your expenses are operating expenses. So there's billing changes there. And there's also surprises that can occur when you have a dive where there's a, there's a very interesting feature that's found and everybody's jumping on the ultra low latency feeds. We're also making sure that we're conscious of changes to our network architecture and making sure that we can prioritize traffic that's going to the cloud instead of just a single facility. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, real quick, actually, to piggyback off of that as well, it, it's not only for telepresence connected science operations that you're looking at cloud streaming. Of course, uh, media and production falls in there as well. And this is something our workflows um, and our processes have all kind of evolved uh, during COVID 19. Um, the IOC was actually well positioned to pivot to remote work um, as we all were working from home. So even though I'm right now in the IOC studio, uh, for the last two years, we've actually been producing everything using cloud based services from the comfort of our dining room table or our home offices or studios. Um, so this is something that we've really uh, leveraged and refined over these last couple of years. Um, and if you look at even professional development that we've been conducting with NOAA Ocean Exploration, when teachers shifted to uh, virtual environments and virtual learning, we needed to meet that need. Um, and we continue to meet that need even though students have shifted back to in-person learning. And even this year in 2021, we've engaged over 800 educators across the US and virtual professional development programming on ocean science and ocean exploration. It's been a really fantastic uh, program uh, to connect with those educators and really provide them some fantastic resources while also connecting with them, uh, connecting them with uh, ocean, expor ocean exploration experts uh, that, you know, provides really engaging content. Um, but let me switch gears back to these questions. Um, so Adam, this might be one for you. And actually, I'm almost tempted to bring Aurora back in for this one as well. How does working within the US EEZ, uh, the US EEZ bounds help or limit NOAA's exploration goals? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one thing to note is that there's a huge amount of the US EEZ that has not been explored. So we don't feel limited in any way by having to work within 
the U.S. EEZ. But uh, really, our mission is is to do the exploration that benefits the American people, and that's uh, right now best done by understanding the resources within our national boundaries. Um, clearly, the the processes that go on in the ocean don't know about these national boundaries, uh, but you know, there's a there's a ton of area, and and it's not just right next to the country. You know, it's out here in the Central Pacific, as well. And so uh, we're really excited to be out here. Great, thanks, Adam. Um, another question about the uh, the feeds that we receive um, from the ship. Um, there's a question from Chris, um, and they would like to know uh, the that they love the live feeds and the interactions. Uh, and will they be able to get 4K feeds uh, that the ship gets on the live feed in the future? So I don't know, Dwight, Rachel, if you guys want to speak to that 4K feed, um, and if that is something in the future that we might that the public might have access to to view as well. Might be tough ship to shore. What do you think, Rachel? A lot of bandwidth. I think it's doable. Uh, a lot of the testing that we have been working on on the last couple of years has been testing newer and more advanced codecs such that we can, specifically looking towards the evolution of 4K, and such that we can get that to shore with the pipes that we have available. Great, thanks. And then uh, shifting gears to a different vessel, uh, where does Okeanos explore archive dives and can the public watch them? Uh, so where where does the footage from the Okeanos go and is that publicly available? Yeah, there's. Uh, I can try to answer that. There's a repository that NOAA maintains um, down at Stennis Space Center. It's called the National Center for Environmental In Information, NCEI. And you can go to the NCEI website and actually search on uh, all the data that's collected by uh, the Okeanos Explorer. And uh, it's also a repository for uh, some of the multi-beam mapping data. Uh, but there's a lot of other uh, sort of uh, uh, um, places that folks can go to get uh, access to highlight videos, to get access to um, other mapping data, such as uh, we're, we're starting with the Nautilus to put a lot of our data into Esri online uh, for ArcGIS content, stuff like that. So, but the NCEI repository, the NOAA repository, is is the is the main archive for all of the Okeanos's footage and uh, and data. Yeah, and then the uh, No Ocean Exploration, their website that they have as well, is a fantastic resource where you can actually go back and look at um, expedition logs and you can find videos as well as still imagery. And oftentimes there's a lot of content that goes with it. So not only do you get to see the, the video that was recorded, but you can also have the context of the expedition and what the major discoveries may have been on that dive, et cetera, um, to wrap around that video that you might be viewing. Um, so keep those questions going. Jason in Michigan, I'm glad that you'll check those different resources out. Appreciate that. Um, so Adam, it looks like somebody may have joined a little bit later, but they were asking about the ocean floor uh, and the footage that was being shown. Uh, where was this ocean floor? So if you could give a quick recap as to where uh, the ship is and where you are exploring, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, we are currently uh, about due west of the island of Kauai, and we are halfway up a seamount that we're calling Seamount F. This is an unnamed series of seamounts. We're exploring all as many of them as we can in the chain, and right now we're on F, and uh, I can show you real quickly what we're seeing right now, but uh, down on the seafloor, we have found this beautiful coral with a couple of uh, sea stars intertwined in it, and this is a lot of what we're seeing down here uh, on the seafloor. Great, thank you, Adam. And I know we're actually getting real close to uh, that hour benchmark. So uh, Adam, I didn't know if you wanted to have, if you had any final remarks to wrap things up here and then I'll throw it back to Aurora. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Holly. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to share a look behind the scenes at, uh, at the Inner Space Center media team that's helped put these seminars together. All of them have been produced, uh, all these six seminars have been produced by the in our space center, this team helps develop the script outlines, brings our talking points to life using produced media that you see pop up behind us. I can't thank them enough for, for their hard work and skill at, at making these look beautiful and seamless and helping us communicate uh, our science as effectively as we can. So uh, big thanks to the, the Inner Space Center. This is the last in a series of six seminars. I wanna end by emphasizing that the partnership with NOAA Exploration uh, 
and OECI, what we do is exploration for the benefit of the nation. And we want everyone to be involved. We've showed you how you can uh, kind of log in and watch these dives as they happen uh, as a member of the public, participate in, in the dives and, and request samples as a member of the scientific community, and all work together to gather the information that helps us develop new medicines, conserve fragile ecosystems, ensure food security, enable green technology for our future. So it's really important and we love it when, uh, when everyone's involved. With ships like uh, EV Nautilus and, and the sport of the Inner Space Center, telepresence really makes that possible. We are uh, in partnership primarily with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration, but we're uh, willing and able to partner with all parts of the federal government. What we're finding is that the technologies that we're developing uh, for the purpose of exploration have lots of benefits beyond just exploring the deep sea floor. They may be a benefit to space exploration, to habitat restoration, offshore wind, fisheries. So uh, we're really excited to see some of our technologies move to an operational state and partner with other parts of the federal government whose mission uh, exists in the ocean. So I want to thank everyone for, for being part of this seminar series uh, and kick it back to, to Dwight and Aurora to wrap up, but uh, we'll sign off here from EV Nautilus. We've got more seafloor to explore right behind us. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Adam, and thank you for tuning in, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you uh, during this broadcast from the Inner Space Center, and uh, have a good holiday, everyone. And back to you, Aurora. Thanks so much, Dwight. I'd like to thank all of our hosts for today from the University of Rhode Island. Um, all of our guests today, Dwight, Adam, Coralie, Paula, Holly, Rachel, and Katie for giving us a glimpse into their exciting work. Uh, also thanks to Bob Ballard for popping in as well today. On behalf of NOAA Ocean Exploration and all of our guests today, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us to learn more about the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. I would also like to thank all of our OECI partners and NOAA collaborators who make this work possible, especially the University of Rhode Island's Inner Space Center who produced this webinar and I'm glad you got to meet them today. This webinar was the final in a six part series highlighting the amazing work of OECI. If you've missed any of the previous programs or even the beginning of this program, you can find links to view the recordings at web.uri.edu slash OECI slash events slash NSSS, and that should be at the bottom of your screen. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed learning about OECI. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye, everyone.